Amigos, welcome back to the podcast and and to um, recording number 10 million of this very same intro. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that there isn't all kinds of beautiful ways I could introduce this episode. It's more that there was so much there that it was really hard for me to pick a lane. And it's really important to me to tee these up for you in a proper way. So uh, yeah, yeah, you'll just want to be thanking me later for not having to listen to all of the other intros that I've recorded. So I probably haven't shared here uh, that I I always wished that I were a Jesuit monk. Kind of left out of that, left out of that potential on account of not being a dude, but. I just really wanted to uh, live in a beautiful place and learn things and grow things without anybody, you know, asking me to do anything else. And I imagine my life sort of being like that of the great uh, Baltazar Gracian, uh, a, a Catalan Jesuit monk. And he famously said, so many things. I, and, and I highly recommend that you read some of his works. He's actually quite a famous uh, philosopher. But one of his best lines, I think, is, uh, he that has satisfied his thirst turns his back on the well. And um, he was great with those turns of phrase. Uh, and let me just say that our guest today is a very thirsty man. And uh, his name is Miguel Torres. Miguel is the fifth generation, depending on how you how you stack it up, um, of and general manager of Familia Torres. And if you follow Spanish wines, you will certainly know the name. And um, he currently runs the the domain with his sister Mireya, and they have had such a journey. And we get deep into that journey, but. As relevant to this podcast, they've really taken it quite seriously to be the fifth standing generation in this place that is so special. And they discovered along the way that while they thought they were doing things very, very well by the land, there was a lot of room to do them better and, and had some real kind of honest looks at, at themselves along the way. And I think that um, it really speaks to the integrity of that family, but also their commitment to the entire region because they also have started helping other growers along the path as well. I am very excited to share Miguel's story with you. He is such a wonderful person. And, you know, it, it can feel a little intense sometimes to talk to somebody who just exudes chivalry and wholesomeness because of how I am. But I have to say, he's the kind of person you talk to and you just like want to be a better person. So I highly recommend you you listen all the way to the end because there's some just gold nuggets in there. And um, I just want to take a, a little second to, again, thank my comrades at the No-Till Market Garden podcast. Everybody there, so, so generous, so nice to me, um, so willing to... <laughs> to tell me I'm I'm doing an okay job. So thanks guys. And uh, after a word from Farmer Jesse, we'll get into my interview with Miguel. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by Johnny Selected Seeds. Johnny Selected Seeds is a proud sponsor of the No-Till Market Garden podcast. Since 1973, Johnny's has supported farmers and gardeners with superior seeds, tools, and information to help ensure their growing success and help feed their communities and families. The research farm is at the heart of Johnny's, where they trial thousands of varieties and tools every year. Their breeding program uniquely focuses on introducing varieties that meet the needs or solve the challenges mixed market, small farmers, and avid gardeners face. Visit johnnyseeds.com for innovative new varieties and time-tested favorites to grow this season. You can also browse their online growers library, link in the description, for a wealth of free educational resources. The employee owners at Johnny's look forward to growing with you. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, 
flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest. Growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right. Enjoy the show. Miguel, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Well, it's, it's great to be with you, Mimi. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be great if, uh, for our listeners, you could tell us a little bit about where you are in the world, what you grow, and a little bit about your um, how many acres you farm and, and how you do it. Yeah. Well, um, I'm in Spain. Uh, mm quite close to Barcelona, more or less like 30 miles far away from Barcelona, in a wine region called the Penedes. Huh? But, uh, well, my I, I come from a family of multiple generations uh, de- dedicating to, um, you know, to the vineyards, to winemaking. And, um, yeah, and that's what we do for a long time. <laughs> And am I correct that you are the fifth generation in your family to be on the same in the same place? Yeah, well, I'm I'm the fifth generation since uh, we started to put our name in in the wines. But if we count from the moment that uh, we started, uh, you know, taking care of the vineyards and you know, to being vine growers, we can go back to the 16th century. So we we can say that <laughs> we always say that it's almost a miracle that we're. We are still here, but but we still love it, and uh, it's something that we love to pass from generation to generation. That's incredible. It's such a it's such a powerful story to have so many generations of a family um, kind of telling the stories of the land through through the wines that you make, and I can't wait to talk more about that. Can you can you? help share a little bit about, um, you know, what it's like where you grow, the sort of limitations of the climate or the constraints of your different terroirs, um, just kind of some of the realities that you have to deal with with your with your farming from a climate perspective. Yeah, well, m- most of our vineyards they are located uh, here in Catalonia, but uh, Catalonia has, uh, you know, a, a quite uh, many diverse climates, you know, I mean, you can go from very close to the Mediterranean Sea, that is very Mediterranean climate, obviously, or you can go uh, almost up to the to the Pyrenees, where the climate is is a lot cooler and you are at a much higher altitude. But most of our vineyards are are in the in the central or more closer to the coast. No? So here, with the Mediterranean climate, uh, we would say that. Uh, that the weather conditions are, are quite specific. We we get most of the times rain that is very spread through through the year, okay? But we don't get a lot of rain, okay? So uh, most of the time is dry farming. Um, and uh, it has been like this uh, traditionally for, for a lot of time, no? Now we, we see during the past decades how, how the weather is changing and how the climate is changing so somehow and and we need to adapt to, no? And uh, and it's uh, and it's quite a quite a strong change because just in the in the past decades, you know, uh, we we are really seeing, you know, like uh, changes that that, for example, for my father, no, that he has, uh, I mean, now he's 81 years old and he has seen a lot of different harvests, no? And uh, and it's very important to have him because it's it's. Uh, he, he has the experience, he remembers uh, how it was to grow grapes here, you know, uh, 40 or 60 years ago. No? I feel the same way when I speak with my family about just the changes that I observed growing up um, and how quickly things have changed now. I mean, we we just recently um, finished our harvest and this was a very late harvest in the last 10, but this is when we always used to harvest when I was young. And certainly when my parents were getting started, we would always harvest towards the end of October. And that, I mean, that is just very rare anymore that we would harvest in October. Is that kind of the same for you? Yeah, well, here uh, from the records that we have and from the memory of my 
or my father, yeah, we, we used to harvest most of the times in September here. Uh, when you go around the towns, well, there are a lot, a lot of towns around the vineyards here, and, uh, and uh, they have something in September that they call it the Fiesta Mayor, no? It's like the, the biggest festivity of the year where everybody joins, all the families, they celebrate. And, and you know, uh, in the past, there was a coincidence with the times of the harvest, you know? They were harvesting the grapes, and then they were making this big celebration. Now, the truth is that, you know, for especially for white varieties, they already start uh, at, the, at the end of August and sometimes, you know, the third week of August and uh, and the Fiesta Mayor came much later, right? So you, you can already see, see this with the popular calendar, no? That uh, there's, there's something that is not matching anymore. No? Definitely. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is just about how you've how this journey has started for you to start taking you know climate change very seriously your family and your business have been very aggressive in your um, measures to address climate change and your responsibility on the land and i would love for you to share a little bit about you know what what got you started and uh, you know how you keep going because i know it's it's a lot <laughs> No, you know, like, uh, as we were saying before, we are a family from, um, that we have been here for many generations, no? And, and something that I already remember from my grandfather when I was a kid was always, uh, he was saying, well, the, the more we care about our vineyards, uh, the better are going to be our wines, no? On those times I was a kid and I had no, no, no idea what he was talking about. No? <laughs> but these are the kind of things that with, with time you realize that there's a, wisdom there no he, he was the the first uh generation in my family that uh, stopped using any kind of herbicides or pesticides and on those times there it was very very common every everybody was using those no? but of course uh in the generation of my grandfather nobody knew anything about climate change so you know we we were still using you know the the tractors we were tilling the soils everything no so then uh, then it came my uh it came my father and uh, with my father, uh, especially, I remember that was the year 2008, where uh, suddenly, uh, well, we realized thanks to this movie, no, an inconvenient truth, mm -hmm. no? <laughs> that, that uh, something was happening because uh, we were all very surprised that, uh, that we were harvesting the grapes uh, earlier and earlier, but honestly, we did not know why. We said, what is going on here? We, we don't know. And 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 that day you know when, when we went to the cinema and we realized that that this could have an explanation then we realized that uh, that all the work of many generations how it was in danger no because we were also thinking that we are going to pass on the vineyards to the next generation and this is something that make us you know uh, wake up in the morning and work work hard it, it's something that is that is on us, no? And um, and suddenly we realized that uh, we may not uh, continue making wines or, you know, there was definitely, uh, we, we, we could not see the future, you know, on a, on a, on a clear way, you know. Uh, in the past, every generation was doing more or less the same as the previous generation. And now, suddenly, we, we had a big problem and we don't know how to solve it, no? So as, as, we're a, as we're a family, we, we decide that we, we had to do some changes, no? And the, and the most important change for us on those years was to, was to reduce the carbon footprint. We realized, we start to calculate all the carbon that, uh, that was uh, at the end, you know, the equivalent of carbon that was used uh, because of the use of energy in the winery, because of the packaging, because of many, many different things that we were doing. And then we, we set up the objective to reduce our carbon footprint as much as possible. We set some milestones, no? Um, uh, on 2020, we, we had to reach a 30% reduction. In 2040, 60% reduction. And when I'm, when I'm talking about reduction, I'm talking about one bottle from 2008, you know, uh, had, you know, 30% more carbon emissions than the ones that we're producing today, you know. So uh, actually, when, when we set these milestones, we really did not have any idea about how we we're going to accomplish them, but we really wanted to do it, you know. And setting a goal 
help us a lot to really fight for it. Uh, so we started to investigate and to, and to try to find alternative energies that we could use in the winery, how to make our bottles lighter, uh, how to um, how to use less energy in general in uh, in all the process of winemaking on the transportation too, and so this this has not been just one single project. It has been like a puzzle of many different projects that allow us to to reduce the carbon footprint. No, so um, on on that side everything was was going well, and we thought that we were doing the right thing, but. But at the same time, uh, especially with my father, we were always having conversations about, yeah, we, we have to plant more, uh, more forests, no? because the forest uh, really can capture carbon. And one day walking in the vineyards, uh, we started discussing about why a forest was capturing carbon and why uh, a vineyard uh, was not capturing. Or, well, actually, we did not know if a vineyard was capturing carbon or it was not. No? So uh, we suddenly started to have some pain in our belly, you know, we, we started to feel like there was a big area of what we were doing that we did not know what was going on. And then we, we realized that uh, even that most of our vineyards were uh, certified as organic viticulture for many years, um, actually our soils were very, very poor with very low organic matter and they were actually not storing any carbon. It was all the opposite. We were using all these tractors, tilling and plowing the soil and, and we were putting all this carbon from the soil back to the atmosphere. No? So we realized that, uh, I mean, with, with the information we have today, uh, what we were doing did not have any, any, any sense. And we, we have we start to, to change we start to learn about which kind of viticulture could we do uh, beyond organic or ecological viticulture so that we could store carbon and we could really you know close the cycle you know as as much as possible and then is is when we started to work on generating the soils i um uh I'm coming from a background that is uh, that that is more on the business side. Then I study enology, but during the past years, I've dedicated a lot, a lot of time to study the soils. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Alan Savory, he was a great. Uh, uh, he's well, he's a person that has inspired a lot of people, and he also inspired me and in my team in order that that we could uh, find solutions there, no? And, and this is what we are doing. We are, we are changing all our vineyards in, in Spain. And also we, we have some vineyards in Chile and we are all, we are changing them in order that they can capture carbon. Right? And would you say that, that that transition has been more challenging than say the, the transition to organic viticulture? Well, it is it is definitely more more challenging because uh, organic viticulture actually is quite simple. You you just have to follow certain protocols. Uh, you just have to use. Uh, you, you can spray with copper. You can do certain things. But but you know if if you have the right climate, uh, like we 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 have here the, with the Mediterranean climate, you know it's very dry. It doesn't rain much. So you know it's it's quite it's quite easy to do organic viticulture. When we're coming to regenerative, uh, I have to say there is not like a perfect uh, book or a perfect guide of everything that you have to do because every every parcel that we have, every vineyard is different. No, it is very different. A vineyard that we have in the Priorat region in the south of Catalonia that is very stony soil, very laid, you know, with uh, with slopes with a great inclination. Sometimes they can reach forty five degrees or more. No. Uh, or, you know, when, when I'm here now in the Penedès with more calcareous and clay, clay soils that are more in hills or, or uh, you know, the bottoms of the valley, it is very, very different. No? So, uh, and also uh, all the regenerative movement did not actually started so much on, on the viticulture, you know. It started on, you know, on with, uh, with, with animals you know with uh, i don't know how to say this in english no? grazing but, mm -hmm. but with, yeah exactly yeah. with the grazing no so uh how to bring this into viticulture uh sometimes it has it has been a challenge but uh 
what we believe is that at the end, uh, it's a uh, it's something. I mean, this is the right path. This is we are absolutely convinced about that. And then some. Sometimes you 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 succeed. Uh, you know, doing certain things. Sometimes you find difficulties doing other things. But it's a learning process, no? So um, fortunately, we we have friends uh, here in Spain and all over the world where we can share, where we can discuss things. And I can tell you, you know, when when you change, you know, a, a soil that has been used for many generations, that that it has been blow and has not not so much life, I have to say, not so much organic matter, and you want to turn it into a soil that. That is a life that has uh, micro, uh, you know, that has diversity, uh, that has microbial life, uh, that has a higher content of organic matter. It's a transition. It's a transition. You 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 cannot you you know this well. You know you cannot do that from one day into another. Uh, it takes uh, years, uh, many many times. But uh, once you start, you cannot go back. You know you have to you have to continue. It is one of those. Um one of those one way, one way journeys, I think. Um, and it's, it it is a beautiful thing to, to go through, but it is very challenging and it can be very stressful. I know, especially when, you know, you have several drought years or you have very shallow soils. And so can you talk a little bit about in different regions, have you had to do a lot of experimentation with the different types of cover crops, or did you see? Did you just let native vegetation come up? What? How did you? How did you approach making this transition in the different places where your challenges are di- are different and specific? Well, uh, here in in Catalonia, you know, we we have quite uh, many hectares. Huh? You 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 talk in acres. We here, we, <laughs> you know, we talk in hectares. Uh, my family at the end of all these years we have uh, achieved to get close to 1100 hectares okay this is a lot of different vineyards so what what we decided what what i decided here is is that there were always uh, some vineyards that were uh, i don't know how you how you say this in english but at the point of the arrow you know like like the like the ones where you really do everything and you really put the most effort, uh, the most time of all the team, no? So uh, this is, these are actually the vineyards that are around my house, you know, because these vineyards are very close. This uh, allows me to really check on every single thing that we are doing, no? And um, so uh, this is the vineyard of Mas, Mas La Plana. And, and here we have done, we are doing, I think we are applying all the techniques that we know about re- generative uh, viticulture and how to regenerate soils no to the point that that we we have our own shepherd no uh, that that was with us a full time we have our own sheep uh, we are actually fencing uh, very important parts of the vineyard so that we can do a planified grazing uh, especially during the months from the autumn to the springtime because otherwise the sheep like very much our uh, our leaves and they our do grapes. like them uh, so yes they do <laughs> <laughs> they, they do we have tried many things in order to to control that but they still like like the uh, leaves very very much and we are we we have planted uh, from uh, different kind of uh, ground covers uh, uh, that but also we have left parcels with a natural ground ground cover, no, to 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 see what happened with the autochthonous uh, grass, no. What we see is that many times when a, when a soil has been used for many years, at the beginning it helps to to uh, to to plant your your own ground cover because it's a way to break the cycle. It's a way to start bringing uh, life into the soil. To start bringing insects, to start bringing microbial life, and then maybe it's not so necessary to keep planting, uh, you know, uh, like guminoses or other other kind of uh, plants, because nature by itself has the power of, uh, you know, of of getting there, uh, achieving to get its own space, no, and coexisting maybe with the plants that you already planted at the beginning, but really getting uh, like a, like a stronger position there, no. 
and and that's what what we are doing the most. We are uh, we are actually also uh, having a very uh, scientific approach. You know, we are measuring every single thing that we are doing. No. Uh, which is the fertility of the soils right at the beginning when we start the process of regenerating the soils, uh, what happens when we plant different kind of plants, no? uh, which is the effect that this can bring, uh, depending on the soils too, depending on the rain. So at, at the end, it's a, it's a lear learning process. And uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are happy with, the, with this path, but... but but there are moments that are hard too, you know. For example, uh, this past summer has been one of the uh, driest summer that we had here in, in Spain. Uh, the harvest came very, very early and we, we, we had uh, four waves of heat, you know. This is something that it has not happened like this in, in well, some, it's not something that we can remember, no, even, no. So this, this, uh, these waves of heat, the effect that they have is that they suck out the water from the soil. So you actually have a, a minus rain, no? So you have to cover when it rains and then you, you, you have to extract all the water that has left, no? So in, this, in these conditions, what we have learned also is that we, we also have to be careful about how we manage the ground cover, no? Because it's very different when you come from a uh, winter time that there was a lot of rain and then you can really let the grass, you know, grow and really um, there's not so much competition between the vines and uh, well, a winter that is very dry, you no, know? then you, you have to be more careful. Uh, you have to bring the animals a bit before or to, or to cut the grass so that you can reduce the competition. Also, it's very different if you, if you have young vines than if you have old vines, no? If you have all, all vines, well, I was working here in the summer and, and they still look pretty, you know, with green uh, leaves, you know, and, and you could see that the roots, they were very down and there was not such a competition. But with young vines, there was definitely competition, no? So uh, uh, this is the, the, the transition process, no? Once, once the soil is more regenerated and, and you achieve to, to create a different structure there, uh, it helps a lot in order to, to absorb the water. No, when the, when the rain comes, the water really stays much, much better. No, the, the challenging part is always when you make this transition. This is, this is how I feel. And, and this is for, for many people that I've talked with. This is always the, the, the challenging part, but it's worth it still. Yeah? It is. I mean, it's, it's the same with, with me. I, every person that I talk to who's, gotten on the same path those years when you are building soil i mean it's an investment and it's one that it, it doesn't pay off immediately um and you really have to commit to it because over time and and it's especially challenging i think if during that transition period you have a lot of drought years and Unfortunately, I think that's going to be the reality for a lot of people who do make this transition now, but it is still possible to build that back in and give yourself that resilience for the future. So I think it's what you say is so important um, for people to hear just that it's it's not always super easy. It, it doesn't just come right away. And depending on where you are in the world and what your season is like, you may have to do things a little bit differently to just make it through um, to that next year. But it is it is buying you a bigger bank to be able to use in the future. And I think that that's just really important what you say there. Totally, totally. And, 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 the, and the truth is that the more that you learn you know, in order to prepare your, yourself for this transition, the better are you going to do this transition? You know, I, I know people that uh, they, 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 they fall in love with the regenerative concept, but they really, you know, did not study much or they did not really talk with a lot of people. So they, they just, you know, let, let the ground cover to get everything in. And then suddenly, you know, they, 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 they could face some challenges there or so, some, or some problems, no? But I, but what is true is that uh, today, there are a lot of techniques that allow you, you know, to really make this transition much smoother, no, than, uh, than something that it has not been planified or that it has not been thought, no. 
for example, you know, I, I told to many farmers here, okay, uh, farmers that they have tilled all their soils, you know, for, for many years. I said, look, you know, why don't you try something? You, you just till the, the side that is very close to the vine, okay, but you don't till the central part, okay? Uh, okay, this is, this is not perfect, but it's already a, a, a great step forward. And it's a, a step where, you know, when it's a difficult year, they, they can still keep the ground covered. They can still have a reasonable harvest. And then step by step, as they build the soil, they convince themselves that they can do the next step, no? And um, so it takes, it, it takes uh, time and sometimes it takes uh, some convincement there, but, uh, but it's possible, absolutely. And it's, it's working. So it's, uh, yeah, we're very proud of it. <laughs> As you should be. And I think it's, it's, again, what you say there is so important that so much of the, so much of the challenge is just gaining confidence um, that you are not, <laughs> that you are not going to lose everything in one, in one year. Yeah, I, I you know, um, I want to comment about that, uh, you know, before, because uh, one of the most important challenges is, is actually the, the people itself. You know the, the people itself because if you if you don't have a you know team or, or like people that are convinced about this change just by yourself you know i have to say it's going to be very very hard you know uh, if, if you have people in the vineyard that are not convinced and especially i have to say here in europe nowhere that the weight of tradition is so so uh so heavy you know it it's, sure uh, is <laughs> it's uh, hard no so uh, when when I met uh, Alan Savory, I remember that that he told me that that there's people who that don't want to learn because they have their ego, you know, and uh, and our ego sometimes stop us, you know. We don't like somebody to tell us that knows uh, something more and different than what we know, no. And the other thing uh, also is the things that we already know, you know. Some sometimes what we have learned through our life, we believe that that's the only knowledge, you know. And this stop us uh, to learn uh, on, a, on, a, on a very bad way, you know. So, for example, I can tell you that in our experience, before we embrace the regenerative viticulture, we spent almost like six months with, with all our team here in viticulture, just uh, reading books, uh, talking to people, watching videos, you know. Uh, and, and there was a certain point where... Uh, where, where people started to realize that that this was possible, no, and then they they wanted to prove themselves that they could do it, no, and and now I can tell you that is great, you know, when when the vineyards uh, managers or the people who work in the vineyard side come to the vineyard, they know that they are doing a lot more than grapes to make wine, you know, it, yeah. it's a much bigger job because they are really, you know, helping our environment, they are helping you know, to, to do something, you know, at least what they can do to, to fight against, uh, against climate change, you know, they have a much important task than, than the one that they had in the past. And, and, and you can see in them, there's a change in the people that is so important. I've seen the same thing. I just, and not only just the feeling that you are doing something that will help your children's future, but also, you you know when you work outside and that's your and that's your job and you start to see the beauty coming back and the the way that it smells and the way that it feels to work in the field compared to what it used to look like even you know 10 years ago that makes a huge difference in what it's like to go to work every day and i've seen the same thing in people it's just it's pretty wonderful to see actually <laughs> it's, it's amazing you know here here, here, for example, now we there's a lot of people that come from a, from a town nearby just to just to walk around here, you know. And I and I don't remember, you know, when I was a kid, people coming to walk around here. You mm -hmm. know, it was a, it was a it was a nice vineyard, no. But now you can see, you know, that uh, there, there's so much uh, diversity, you know, and it keeps coming. We we we, for example, have a census of the of the uh, different species of birds that we have, no. And, and how they, they have increased during these past years. Uh, you can see, you know, when you walk around, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a grass, grassland. It's so pretty. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. No? There's so much energy there. Um, 
well i think that is uh, it, uh, also the 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 changes that it makes uh, they are in the soil but also outside no and, yeah. and i think that we are in a in, we we have a job we're in a business that that we want to create something unique when we make wine we will, we want to make wines that really bring the essence of our soils of our land no and it's much better when this land is is beautiful too yeah <laughs> well and and i there's there's quite a bit of research in the united states about this i don't know if you've come across any of it but the effects on people's mental health and the sort of capacity of a person to, you know, just be able to engage in everyday life is so tied to what they see on the daily basis and in, in their environment. And that when things are verdant and beautiful and healthy, that that makes a huge difference in, you know, how many days kids miss from school and how many days people miss of work. And I, I mean, I think that that's really underestimated when we think about these changes that we could be making in terms of, you know, our overall productivity and um, just our overall resilience in, in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I was, uh, I was just reading a book that, uh, that talks about, about how, uh, how even, you know, the uh, smells, even uh, some uh, certain kind of molecules that uh, that sometimes we we cannot perceive from a conscious point of, of view, uh, but uh, when we walk, for example, in a forest, no, we are so connected anthropologically talking uh, with the forest as a place that brought us, you know, like safety, uh, food, shelter, and 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 so on. That uh, it is proved that the that the trees bring these molecules into the air that gives us, you know, this this. Uh, this peace of mind, this uh, this relaxation, this feeling good, no. So uh, yeah, why 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 this cannot happen also uh, with our agriculture, no? Where we can go to work, you know, with uh, with our families, and we can really feel that connection. I think that this is this is the best world possible. It really is. I feel the same way. Um, and along those lines, um, you have also made an investment in trying to search out and rediscover basically some of the ancestral varieties that may be more suited to you know the future climate um, would you like to would you like to share a little bit about that work yeah yeah well this uh this is a work that, that we started around 30 years ago and uh it was a it was a random start to to be honest there was a professor in france in viticulture uh, monsieur bobals was was called that uh, that told on those times to my father that there was the possibility that these vines that existed before the phylloxera no uh, they, they were still surviving in a, in a, in a wild basis maybe in a forest or, or so on so because we we knew that in catalonia the where i live here well in, there used to be a lot of uh, ancient varieties. We start putting ads, no, as in the newspapers, in the local newspapers, oh, wow. uh, saying uh, if, if you are a vine grower and you find a vine that you don't know what it is near your uh, house, near your farm, so on, you can call us and, and we're going to go there and, and check which kind of vine it is. Uh, we uh, we can check the DNA and so on. So uh, we thought that nobody was going to call, but. Uh, people from all around Catalonia started to call us, no? And uh, so every single time we were going there and we were checking which which kind of vine was that, no? And many times I can tell you these were vines that were uh, growing in the middle of a forest, climbing a tree, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, many times there were vines that we knew, but uh, now after 30 years, uh, we have found in 60, 64 occasions, uh, these have been uh vines with a unique dna okay so uh we will work with a technique called uh, micro satellites so that we we, we can make sure at 99.8 percent that uh, that the dna is different than the varieties that that we already have and we know here no so uh, we we planted uh these uh, we we actually call them ancestral varieties we put them this name because they came from ancient times and we we planted these varieties uh, as a collection 
And then some years ago, we, we started to see that, you know, even in, in very hot, hot summers with very uh, lack of rain, there were some of these varieties that were making very nice grapes, you know, and that, you know, that the vines were still green and very nice. And we say, look, you know, maybe uh, maybe we should start um, experimenting and making wine again with these grape varieties. And uh, and that's what we did. We, we have selected the best ones from these uh, 64 that we have founded. And, uh, and some of them are really, you know, like a gift because they uh, they give us a lot of acidity. We can harvest them very late in October time, so then the 15th of, of October, no? Uh, they have a lot of freshness, no? And uh, well, we we don't know why why these varieties are like this, no? But but some people have told us that uh, during the Middle Ages in Europe there was a period of climate change where where the temperatures were much warmer, no? So probably these kind of varieties were more suited for that those period of of uh, times, no? When when the when the earth started to cool down, to have these varieties that were uh, ripening so late, it was very dangerous because you know uh, to wait so much time, you could lose the harvest. You, know? you could it could be coming the rain or you know fungus diseases, and and then you could lose everything. So um, now they are really working, and and to us is. I mean, we never thought about this, you know, that uh, a variety from the past could help us to, to make our wines in the future. And um, Mimi, I, I can tell you today, these are the varieties that I'm planting the most, you know, cause, because we see that they are really good for that. That's so exciting. And when, you know, when we were in, in London together, I, I w- was lucky enough to be able to taste some of these. And I can, I can tell everybody listening that they are well worth seeking out and will be very, ex- I'm, I mean, I would love to lay some of those wines down for, you know, 20, 30 years and they, cause they, certainly have the stuff to live a long time that you can tell already so that's i'm it's such a treasure to be able to talk to somebody whose family has been generationally committed in this way because you can you can follow these stories for so much farther back in history than any you know anyone else i know um and that's i mean i think that's such a gift and it's so amazing how you've chosen to share that with the world well Mimi, thank you for your words uh, some sometimes we you know when we are uh, with uh, with the whole family we have fun of ourselves because we always think you know we we admire people that know how to do so many things you know and they are so you know so smart and they can do investments in so many things that the only thing that we know honestly is about the vineyards and wine making you know? so <laughs> this is this is what we know huh? after all these years well you're very you're very humble you you know a lot about a lot of things um and we're, we're gonna get into some more of that too today's episode is brought to you by real organic project does your farm deserve to be recognized for all the hard work done on behalf of the environment and your community Real Organic Project is an add-on certification that partners with 1,000-plus certified organic farms across North America, including my own farm, Rough Draft Farmstead, available at no cost to farmers and with minimal time commitment. It is a great way to differentiate your farm from mass-marketed corporate organic where hydroponic production and animal confinement are still commonplace. Real Organic Project is a whole farm certification program to distinguish crops grown in healthy soils and livestock raised humanely on pasture. As a farmer-led movement, we know many hands make for quick work. I hope you will lend yours by signing up for Real Organic Project certification today. Visit realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. That's realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. Today's episode is also brought to you by Tilth Soil. This Cleveland, Ohio-based company is producing some of the highest quality potting mixes out there. One of the biggest lessons I learned in farming is the importance of good seed starting mixes, and that's why I included Till Soil in my book and have been using their seed starting mix, Sprout, on my farm since 2020. Till Soil produces potting mixes approved for use in organic operations like our own. Their living soil is made with fully composted food waste they collect and process themselves. Whether you need a cubic yard super sack once a year or ongoing deliveries for your year-round operation, Tilth has you covered. The team at Tilth can help with shipping, coordination, and provide ongoing support throughout the growing season. 
To learn more, visit www.tilthsoil.com. That's tilthsoil.com. All right, back to the show. Have you noticed um, since you've been managing your soils in a more regenerative way, have you noticed changes in the wine chemistry or how you make wine and, and maybe some of the um, some of the challenges that maybe used to be part of the winemaking aren't there anymore or have you, you encountered new problems? How is that... Or has that changed your winemaking at all? Well, this is this is a question that that I got, that I have many many times, but because uh, we we also are approaching it from a, from a very you know uh, also scientific point of view, uh, we we also believe that we need more time to understand this, you know, because uh, wine is is some is is a product that that takes time first to make it no uh of course when we're talking about regenerating soils but also to see as it evolves how it ages and so on no what what we know of course and and this is not even from the wine no is that when any kind of um uh, fruit or vegetable are grown uh, in in uh, soils that have diversity that have life that they have been regenerated, the amount of vitamins, nutrients, the the, the how they nourish is, is is much much better than than a conventional one. No? So we I mean we know that this is that this is happening with the grapes too. No, uh, uh, how this is going to affect the taste? Uh, are we going to see this? I think that that time will will uh, tell us. Uh, but but to me, you know, if the if the wine tastes a bit better or a bit worse, m- maybe it's not the most important thing. You know, I I, I think that the, the important thing is that we are doing the. I believe that we are doing the right thing. No, uh, to to have agriculture, to have viticulture. I cannot imagine doing viticulture in another way. Now, it 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 would not be fair. It would not. Uh, it would not be honest. I. Could not, I, I just love how you said that because when I think about, um, people ask me about, you know, it does growing regenerative grapes make better wine? Um, and I don't love the question because I'm not going to tell somebody what they, what they like or don't like. You like it, you, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. What matters the most to me is the land and the integrity of how I show up with my land. And I do think that the story could never be more honest than when you are showing up in this way. And so um, I just, I really appreciate how you said that. And it, it means a lot to me because anybody who says better or worse, <laughs> I just don't think they know very much. Um, and, and like you say, I mean, we, um, winemaking is a, is a process and, um, it, you know, sometimes things seem a little better and then 10 years later they seem a little worse or vice versa. And so we, we really don't know what we don't know, I think at this stage and, um, we can only follow our, our hearts and our integrity. So, has your family, uh, would you say, it seems like, you know, from the outside, it seems like you have all been very committed um, all throughout. Has that been the case? Have, did you encounter any any pushback when you, when you wanted to start changing the viticulture or because, I mean, for me at least, introducing the idea of not cultivating was a big it was a big deal and it was a big shift for people to wrap their heads around. Um, did you, did you encounter any resistance when you first got on this path? Well, um, yeah, I think that, I think that, uh, well, you, you know, well, but everyone who starts in these, uh, and especially in viticulture where your neighbor has a vineyard close by, you know, there's, there's, there's always, always a certain amount of criticism, you know, and, you know, just, just because you are doing something different, no? Uh, I, I remember, uh, vine growers close by coming and, you know, uh, starting to talk that our, our, our winery was not going well because we, we were not 
allowing, you know, we, we, we not have the money to pay for the tractors and the gas and, you know, criticizing these, that Torres is not, you know, it's not going well. Well, you know, all that, we were just um, dirty vine growers because we were not taking the bad weeds out, no? Mm -hmm. and, and this, of course, in a town like this, it goes very, very fast and spreads, no? Uh, but, you know, even, I would say, even inside my family, sometimes it was not, not 100% easy, you know, one, one may think, oh, you know, the whole family is going to go forward, <laughs> but even in a family, sometimes you, you, you have to convince, uh, you have to convince people, you know, I, even, uh, I remember having some conversations with my father, no, and, uh, and my father, uh, you know, he started in friends, no, and of course, when, when he was young and he was in friends studying, uh, you know, there was no regenerativity culture in the sense that this concept did, did not exist. No, it was all pretty much about technology. You know, so you know when when we uh, started to make this change at the beginning, also he uh, he had some doubts. No, but then step by step, you know, we uh, started to show you know that it was a good path. We started to show you know how. Uh, you know, with, with scientific proofs, how, how we were uh, retaining more carbon in the, in the soils too. And, and now, well, now we, I, I think that, that we could not think about having vineyards uh, without thinking on the, on the regenerative approach. No? But at the beginning, it takes, it takes a bit of, of time and yeah, you have to push forward and yes, <laughs> it's not, it's not 100% easy, but nothing is, right? So, Nothing worth doing is is ever easy. At least that's my that's my motto. <laughs> um, <laughs> I meant to ask when you when we were speaking about the ancestral varieties, are you planting those as cuttings? Are they on rootstock? Are they just own rooted in place? How does that? How do you do that? Well, we we do it in in every way possible. You know, uh, especially you know at the beginning. When we, you want to have the first results, uh, many times we graft, mm -hmm. okay, because then in just in a couple of years you can have the grapes and, and see how it works. But then once we w once we know mo more or less how how this vine is going to work, then we always uh, well we uh, we plant in pot, you no, know, we, we uh, so that's that's uh, the the final objective. You no, know? we we still of course use American rootstock because there's still phylloxera around around us, no? So we, we cannot take the risk and this, what we are planting is still bit is vinifera, no? So we, we uh, always need to make uh, still the grafting, no? But, uh, no, but, but yeah, uh, we, we, what, what we are doing also is that uh, we are, we are sharing these cuttings with the vine growers around here because it was also a discussion in the family, you know, what, what do we do now, you know, with, with all these ancient <laughs> varieties? Uh, and we realized that even that it took us a lot of work to recover them, but honestly, these these varieties were not ours. You know, these varieties were used in Catalonia hundreds of years ago uh, by many many families. No, and uh, so if we are, if we also want our one region to make wines in the future, no, that uh, have good good acidity, good aromatics, and, and these varieties could be a solution, then we open them up to to every vine grower. So now they are. Other wineries, other wine growers that are planting them, and um, yeah, and we are we're trying to share also uh, the results that we're having. That's incredible. With the with the data that you're collecting um, in in your fields, and and as you go on this journey, are you um, are you sharing that at all? I mean, are you, are you part of an organization? I know you've, I know you've started an organization and I would love for you to talk about that, but were you, were you already gathering that data as part of a, another organization you were part of like the, um, savory network or something like that? Well, um, I, uh, you know, when, when we started, uh, what we did, uh, is to start projects with different universities here, uh, in Catalonia and in other parts, even in Spain in order to make projects uh, focus on certain things, you know, uh, to gather data, for example, about how much carbon were we storing, depending on the ground cover, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the kind of soil, how much time it, it would take to regenerate the soils, you know. So all of these are uh, projects that most of them, they are, they are still in process, you know, because it's, it's not something that, that you can do from one year into 
another. Um, so we, we, we also are, I would say, uh, very lucky because we have a technical team here that is very strong. Uh, we have our own labs here, so we can really analyze um, everything that that it can be found in the soil, you know, from uh, from any microbial life, you know, to to or how how the texture of the soil is changing, how is everything, and this helps us a lot because, for example, here in Masa Plana, uh, since the beginning, we divided uh, through many different parcels, you no, know? and in every different parcel is all, almost like an experiment because uh, it's different than the uh, one nearby, so. This, with the time, will allow us also to to, to have better understanding, you know, the, which which are the uh, with the the best practices, mm -hmm. uh, at least when they are vineyards similar to to the ones that we have here. That's incredible. And what are you looking at as the um, with with the university partners? Are those ten year trials? Are they twenty year trials? How how? They are most of the times they are between five to ten uh, to ten years. That's amazing. So you have to think that, that for example, here in the Penedes, when we have more clay and calcareous soil, the fact that, that we have clay help help us a lot. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can see the results a lot faster than in other places. Yeah. No? Uh, you 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 start to see the the um, in uh, Spanish we uh, we call it the complejo arqueómico, no mm -hmm. the Humus uh, clay complex, right? Yeah. Uh, how how is forming and because uh, clay can retain more water, is you can see that that is a bit of a faster uh, process. When we go to the priorat, for example, that is uh, we say stone, mm -hmm. it's much much longer process. Yeah. Uh, we we yeah. we can see that it goes uh, twice uh, slower than what we have here in the Penedes. So this um, to regenerate the soil in the priorat takes at least uh cannot yeah, 12 years minimum minimum yeah. and in the priorat have you done anything different to try to uh, you know with different trials to try to accelerate that like with compost or you know do you use animals there can you use animals there is there even is there even enough soil to grow forage yeah, for there's, animals <laughs> there's, there's 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 not much soil you know we are talking about only between 10 and 20 centimeters of, of loose soil before we touch the mother rock, mm -hmm. right? So these, these are very, very small vines. Uh, they, they have a, a ridiculously small production there, but they are adapted to, to their ecosystem. They don't grow much. Yeah. They are like, uh, like a small trees there, no? One, one of the challenges is, is the, is the animals, no? Because uh, as in the Penedes, we can use uh, sheep in certain places, even even goats. But in the Priorat, uh, it's it's complicated because it's it's very very steep. Um, sheep sheep do sheep do not do well there because you know it's it's a bit risky there. Goats is a it's an animal that in certain <laughs> vineyards for certain time you can put them, but you know that they are very aggressive. They are yes, very aggressive. They are. And, and, and they are going to eat whatever they find, you mm -hmm. know. So uh, it's not the best solution. We we have uh, we have our, our own chicken there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I would love to to see to to find an animal that has more capacity of uh, fertilizing. You know, because the 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 chicken are great. But it's uh, still, it's not easy to manage and, and, and you have to put a lot of density of chicken to really uh, start seeing some results. No? Yeah. So it's, it it's, is, a, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a working process. Uh, we, um, of course, we, we uh, put also compost, no, but, but to, to close the cycle, we would need animals that would help to fertilize better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's too bad we can't. Get you some mountain sheep, some bighorn sheep, or something like that. We'll keep working on that idea. Um, we can send some to me, and we can try those. Yes, I'll bring. <laughs> I'll bring one. I'm dying to visit you. <laughs> I'll bring you a, a little, a mini flock. Um, 
Would you like to share with us um, a little bit about the organization that you've started to help um, to help other growers in Spain get on the same path and um, and how that's going and how it's going to show up in the in the wine world? Yeah, well, uh, as as we were talking, you know, one one very important thing is to is to is to share experience uh, in the in the regenerative world. It's very important to. To, to make friends, to have contacts and to and to share. Uh, because in Spain, there was not many people, maybe, you know, uh, I knew one person in one place, another there, but not many people doing that. Uh, five, five of us, we decided to, to make like a little association, no? Uh, with the purpose mainly of sharing uh, information, no? Uh, so there was a friend of us in the Priorat, uh, there was me, my sister, there was a winemaker in the Penedes too, uh, there was a, a, a person specializing in agriculture from the north of Catalonia. And you know, we, we uh, got together with this association and we started, we put a website there. Uh, we started making events that I hope that you can come to one of them. I, I'm, I'm, I would like to invite you now. <laughs> Because we, we do <laughs> these uh, we we do these uh, forums, no, where we invite people from all around the world. Many times it can be a video conference, but if they can manage to come and, and, and you know spend some time in Europe, uh, this is fantastic. Um, and we bring them to to share their experience, no, with the vine growers that we have here in uh, Catalonia and in the rest of Spain. Sometimes, you know, when you try to explain things, they can listen to you more or less, no? But when somebody from outside, no, from mm -hmm. Spain comes and explains their experience, uh, we have seen a great effect on that, no? They, they, they really see that, that this can really work. So we, we had people like uh, Alan Savory uh, talking for us. Uh, we had uh, Joel Salatin also. Uh, we have Pablo Borrelli, uh, you know, great, great people. Um, explaining about this no? uh, so we, we were so convinced that uh, that we decided that it was very important also to pass this message to the final consumer too no because we realized that uh, there's so much work that you have to do on the on the regenerative that at the end you know after a lot of debate we we saw that if we cannot communicate that to the final consumer the consumer cannot make a choice you know so you can find you can you cannot distinguish between a standard product or a product that there's a lot more work and you know in the soil. So we decided to to come up uh, with a certification uh, that would would help the vine growers from Spain, uh, you know, to to get cert to get certified and to have this access to to more information about the practices that they can do. No? Um, and well, actually, you know, this is a project that started in Spain, but now it has become more international. Uh, you even know that the foundation mm -hmm. for uh, for regenerative culture is also participating there mm -hmm. uh, with with their advice, and we're trying to to bring as much as advice as possible uh, to make sure that this uh, certification is the most complex possible. No, but at the same time, something very important. No. Uh, we want to avoid uh, something, uh, a very bureaucratic certification. Mm -hmm. We want every vine grower to be able to certify, uh, to, to control the practices that uh, they are doing. We are doing an app, you know, like a, an app in your phone that everybody has a phone today where you can take pictures of your ground cover. You can send these pictures. You can access to forums where you can talk to many people and to, uh, and to share your experiences. And, uh, and well, uh, this, uh, this summer was the first pilot, uh, but uh, I, I hope that by the beginning of January, we already will welcome everybody who wants to, to join and to use this certification. There's not only Spanish people, there's people from, from many places around the world that, that also would like to use it. And, and if they find others, this is also fantastic, no? The important thing is that they make the step and that they, they start. That's wonderful. It's incredible. And, you know, I think the, the, the forum is so, 
such an important piece of that because of what you say about needing to share and we can't always gather in person, but being able to just get online with other people and say, Hey, I'm seeing this and it's really freaking me out. Well, you know, has, has anybody else ever seen that? I w- I mean, I so wish that something like that had, um, had existed when I was first getting started because like you say, I didn't know anybody. I, I mean, the only people I knew were not in viticulture and everybody who was growing grapes thought that I was crazy. <laughs> so you just, I mean, it's like you're in a vacuum um, and, and all you have is your own convictions to kind of drive you forward. And so I think that this is one of the most generous generous of spirit things that you have d- that you've done um, d- to be able to gather people and create a space for people to come and share without fear of being judged or um, any of the things that keep us from you know getting better at what we do. Well, you know, I think that every everyone that I met, you know, and and, and you know that this wall at the end, uh, you know, we we happen to know who are who are the producers that are in the states uh, doing a great job like you are doing, or who, who are the producers that are I don't know in Australia and you know, or in uh, South Africa, you no, know, and at, at the end it's like a, <laughs> it's almost like a family, you know, yeah. because you 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 do, talk to one each other. But I can tell you that that uh, every single person that i've met these are people that uh, they they have a great heart and they are willing to share their experience you know they they really are willing to 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 uh, you know to to spread this information to really uh, be generous on on every single sense and and this is something that it never stops uh, amazement you know uh, on the on the sense that um it's very very important you know the the work that you are doing Mimi for for so many years you know I think that you have opened the eyes of, of many many people and, and this this has an incredible value well I I mean and you and I I also would love it if you would talk a little bit about your family's foundation and the the sort of social sustainability work that you do which is truly important I mean, it's incredible, and it's not something that you put out there um, in an ostentatious way. It's just something that your family's obviously committed to. But I would love for you to share a little bit about that because I'm very struck by um, how how big of a deal <laughs> how big of a deal it is, and 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 just how committed you are to that side of you know our future as well. Well, I, I would love my sister to be here because she's uh, uh, we we uh, we call her the president of the foundation because she's really the one that uh, that takes the decisions there and, and she's doing a, a fantastic job. Well, maybe this is something that we we actually we we don't talk about much about this because we we don't want something to become like an like an advertising thing this is something that we do it because uh, we believe it my grandmother started many many years ago and you know as, as, a, as a family company what we do is that every single year when when there are profits because there are years that uh, that that are so that are a bit harder but when there are profits we we put part of these profits to uh, to help, uh, especially projects related with, to, to, the, to the children, to the childhood, no? Uh, we believe that, that at the end, uh, well, children have the, this enormous power, no? this potential to change things, no? to change things in their families, in their towns, in everything. No? Uh, a more grown-up person has it, but the children has it multiplied by, by many, many numbers. No? So at the end, what we have done is basically building, you know, schools, um, many places in from China to India uh, to Africa. Uh, in Mexico, we have projects to take uh, all, to take uh, kids out also from uh, from the street, you know, so that they can uh, start uh, studying, where they can have an environment where, where that they can. Uh, somehow you know change or start to, to produce a change in their lives and um and this has something that is very rewarding because at the end when when you see through the years that that some of these kids make it no and, and can bring 
can bring you know a, a different approach to to what they would have done if they would not have a studies or they would not have the resources to continue it's amazing no it's amazing because you can they they can change so many people you know also so it's a uh, fantastic so anyway this is uh this is something that we like to do and and we hope that we can do it for many years it's it's truly incredible and i can i can say this struck me so much because when i was young um i definitely i i still remember i mean the person who influenced me and really set me on, on a completely different path than I would have otherwise been on. And I had a great childhood. I wasn't in danger or anything. But it's just every person I talk to who is doing incredible work in the world had some important experience when they were young that set them on a path. And you're trying to enable that experience for children around the world who are more than likely not going to have that opportunity. And so I think I, I know you don't like to talk about it because you're very humble, but I think that people should know um, that this is a, a huge part of what your family does. And, and, and I think that if you are truly committed to, <laughs> I mean, people use the word sustainability a lot um, without a lot of stuffing and yet, you you and your family seem to really understand it in a in a very integrated way that is it, it's very impactful and it and makes a it makes a big impression on on me so i i think it probably makes a big impression on a lot of people I, you know i think that every everyone it doesn't matter if it's uh one generation or or two generations or or, or ten generations at the end no i think that uh, the the concept of a family it's a it's a concept that understands well you know the idea of making wine but also to 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 look for the future no because uh, we i mean we we don't have our vineyards here to so that we can sell our company to an investing fund <laughs> anything like this no we we here we have a job and that's that's uh, that's our life no this is the the job that we have until the next generation takes it no and and I believe that uh, uh, most of the families understand this and, and can can really see that uh, that when when you make wine, you are you are making wine. You are a period of of your life. You are for some generations doing that, but uh, but it's not something that you are doing to become you know like a rich or wealthy mm -hmm. or anything like that. You know, you 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 do many other things uh, to do that, but but it gives you like. A, like a life you know with a purpose and at the same time gives you opportunity to think about the future no and and how how you want to 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 put your actions so that they have sense for the future no and, and that's on our work this is also what do what do we do with with uh with the uh, money that we get after uh, making the wine after selling the wine everything has to have a purpose no? yeah well, I'm I want to be respectful of your time and so uh, you know sort of as we wrap up here, I would love I would love for you to just let us all know um at this point having come as far as you've come, what what is the most exciting thing that you are thinking about right now? What's what's really energizing you or making you excited about getting up every day? Well, um well to be honest you know uh since the past years what what still uh gives me a lot of energy to 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 continue and to and to work hard is is what we are doing uh with the vineyards with the soils you know because uh, this is the this is the best gift that i can give to my children for the future no mm -hmm. um, of course you know i hope to I, i'm able to give them an education and everything but but if they have soils that are good, that they are resilient, uh, maybe they are going to be able to continue making wines if they if they want, no? Uh, and maybe this uh, small venture that we started many years ago, it, it, it may continue, no? Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is something that I love, and uh, I have to say, since since we started the project, it changed uh, things also in my life that I 
now have a different perspective and and I, I just can be thankful about that. Yeah. It, it really never gets old. <laughs> I feel the same way. I, I just can't, um, can't quite get enough of the process and, and how much I've learned and still learn every day um, from people like you and from the land itself. And I'm just so grateful that you made the time to speak with me today. Is there anything, um, is there anything that you wish I had asked that I didn't ask? I think that you asked uh, <laughs> many, many good questions. Uh, but anyway, you know, uh, I think that uh, no, you know, I really spent a good time, and uh, it was it was great to to be with you. And you know, for for you and for every everybody who is listening, if you ever uh, happen to stop in Spain in Barcelona, uh, you know that you have a friend here, mm -hmm. uh, Miguel Torres. Uh, uh, our vineyards are very close, and and if you come and and, and you want to see the vineyards, I, I hope I'm around here. I can show them to you, and, and it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place with a lot of history. Mm -hmm. Just as an anecdote, we just discovered uh, close to here, close to our vineyards, maybe uh, 500 meters far away, an archaeological site with more than uh, 5,000 years of uh, of history. No. Oh my goodness! Uh, where, yeah, so we are we are finding a lot of utensils that they use, and and we are we are now seeing if if it also has a relationship with wine because we know that already two thousand five hundred years ago they were making wines here. So let's see if going back through the history we still can find something. You know? Wow, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. That's <laughs> amazing. I now I'm so intrigued. I'm I would love to know more about that. So I I'll definitely. Um, I'll keep emailing you <laughs> to find out how that's all going. That's fascinating. What an what an exciting discovery. Um, was it an accident? Were they developing, or how did that how did that happen? No, no. You know, uh, there was uh, there was. Uh, I think that they wanted to arrange something close close to a house, and, and they had to pass some machinery, and then they they found you know some. Some place where they used to uh, keep the you know the grain uh, you know we we call it sitches but they are like uh, some round deposits and then they started to excavate more and uh, they they have found more than one hundred so this oh was gosh. a place this was a place where people loved to live here uh, they uh, they used to do a lot of agriculture no so. Uh, it gives you a great sense of perspective because you know, we we are really here for a very small period yeah. of time. No, this is a place where five thousand years ago there were people uh, working the soils and and producing food and maybe also wine there. No? Amazing! That is such a great note to end on. Um, that gives me hope. <laughs> that gives me hope. <laughs> we can uh, we can maybe see a little farther into the future than we think we can. Um, well, Miguel Torres, thank you so much for your time today. And we will definitely link to your website and your family's uh, foundation website and any other links that you want to share. I will make sure to gather those after. And again, I just, I want to thank you so much for who you are and um, your devotion to just doing, doing the right, thing and really kind of committing to the long game. And it means a lot to me that you do the work that you do. And I'm just very grateful to know you. And it's been such a pleasure to talk to you again. I, I really appreciate your time. Well, it's a, it's a great, great pleasure. And I hope to see you very, very soon. I mean, it's same. It's great same. to talk to you. Thank you for staying up late. <laughs> No problem. All right. <laughs> you have a great evening. Bye-bye. Okay, so you're super inspired. I know. And check out those wines. Check out his project. Go to their website. See all the beautiful, beautiful things that this family is doing. And, you know, I think a lot of times we we as growers, um, you know, we find podcasts and things like that because, you know, we're, we're alone a lot of the time. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you might even be asking yourself why you do the things that you do, or, or maybe it gets hard and it's hard to stay on the path or, you know, whatever it is that life throws in front of you. Um, not to, uh, not to pretend like I'm some inspirational speaker here, but 
Miguel certainly is. And I think that there's a real reason to be hopeful when there are people like Miguel in the world. And just to, um, you know, wrap it all up by <laughs> quoting another famous Spaniard, not just another famous Spaniard, but another kind of uber famous uh, writer from long ago. When life itself seems lunatic, who knows where madness lies? Perhaps to be too practical is madness. To surrender dreams, this may be madness. Too much sanity may be madness. And maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, babies, who knows who said that? I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> because if you don't know, you must find out. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Farmer Jesse and Farmer Jackson and Dr. Professor and all the badass players at the No-Till Market Garden Podcast and beyond the uh, the universe of no-till growers. And thanks to you guys again for hanging in with me. And thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Familia Torres, for being such a wonderful beacon of light and also for your commitment to helping the rest of us make make it a better place bye for now hey you all farmer jesse here just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on our No-Till Growers YouTube channel. That thing will be kicking back to life again for another season of videos next month. If you have not checked out that channel, head to YouTube and subscribe. There are dozens and dozens of videos over there to watch and learn from. Also, have you peeked at the new No-Till Growers Forum yet over at notillgrowers.com? There are like over, I don't know, a thousand growers there now. So you can go and ask any questions that you have and people like myself, but also a growing list of really excellent and brilliant farmers will chime in and without a bunch of snark and pretension like you sometimes see on other forums. There's not any gatekeeping. It's just a forum uh, for anyone of any level or experience or scale. Like everything we do, that forum is free and open to the public. If you'd like to support our work or the idea of keeping farming information free in general, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or one of the no-till hats, which are back in stock. The proceeds from those sales at notillgrowers.com go to supporting that kind of work. If it's benefited you and you have the means to pitch in, that would be super rad. And of course, you can always become a yearly or monthly patron at patreon.com slash no-till growers. That is the lifeblood of our work. Um, and if you do that over there at patreon.com slash no-till growers, not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Sean at All About the Garden, Bill Altman, Ian at Grindstone Farms, Stephen Smith and Ohio Roots. Huge shout out to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. The Patreon page is super important to it, so we hope you will hop on board. And that's it for me. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>